from fragile to agile? Or how do we develop adaptable organizations that are fit for humans and fit for the future? That's the main theme of today. Why is it that almost all organizations these days have the exact same dream? When you, when you talk to leaders in most organizations, they have this urge to be faster, to be more innovative, and to be more agile. And I think it's fair to say that many organizations are struggling with keeping up an internal pace of change that mirrors the nimbleness of change itself. But for some organizations, they feel that they have their resources in silos and they are not fluid enough. Other organizations have to de-layer. The complexity has simply grown to an extent that they have to do something about it. Some organizations feel that the projects that they're running don't create the impact at the pace that they intended to. Some organizations feel that they have too many internal-oriented processes that are not adding enough value. Maybe it's time to define a must-win battle that's designed at reinventing management or management innovation, if you may. Maybe we need to look at the underlying model that produces the not fast and the not innovation that we dream about and starting to have a look at that. And that's a little bit tricky because the old model, the pyramid, is so ingrained that it's really, really hard to imagine anything but that. So the moment you start thinking in different models, it's tough to follow. When you stand in one paradigm and you're looking into a new, because the world is emerging, it's turbulent, and it's complex, and you have to come up with something that is more agile, the only way to get there is to experiment with certain things that are not working well in your specific organization or in my organization. Uh, we are, I, I think, a point in business history where we have to challenge our deepest assumptions about how we lead and manage and organize. You know, I, many years ago, I wrote a paper called The Core Competence of the Corporation. And if I was rewriting that today, I would probably title it The Core Incompetence of the Corporation. What I see is that organizations tend to struggle with a very familiar, a very common set of disabilities. They are on average, inertial, incremental, and often inhuman. In what sort of organizations do people give their best? Where they feel passionate, uh, where they are willing to take risks, they're gonna stretch themselves, they feel deeply committed, accountable uh, to customers, uh, will go that extra mile. And in my experience, where I at least most frequently see this are in startups. In small organizations where people are excited to be there, they think they're working on a, a kind of a game-changing problem, and they're working in organizations that I would say are bold, simple, lean, open, flat, and free. A recent survey said that 66% of young people today want to join a startup after school. Uh, uh, entrepreneurship is now the, the, the number one track for Wharton Business School students. Uh, one third of all Stanford MBAs are in a startup within three years of graduation. And again, it's not hard to see why. Because most of the alternatives, the large incumbent organizations, are not bold, simple, lean, open, flat, and free. They are actually quite the opposite. And given that, it is no wonder that startups have been reinventing industry after industry around the world. And so the story is, you know, we, we, we see the story again and again and again. New company beats old company. Small company beats big company. And, and it is so familiar that a lot of my colleagues who write and talk about innovation have simply given up. What they say to CEOs is the only way you can innovate is you take some new venture, you sequester it, you protect it in a little incubator far away from the core business, and hopefully there it, will, it can be grow and it will, it'll nourish. Generally, that doesn't happen. Because however successful they may be, they are nowhere near big enough and successful enough to compensate for a core business that's slowly losing its economic vitality. 
How much better would our economies be? How much better would economic growth would be? How much better would our lives be if every organization was entrepreneurial at their core? So yeah, that's why I'm a little upset. And so, you know, if you kind of dig into this, you say, so like, what's, what's the real problem here? You know, the real problem is, is not a disruptive business model. The real problem is out of date management models, what we call bureaucracy. And, you know, we can feel quite enlightened and, and bureaucracy seems like a very old fashioned word, a little bit like horsepower, it seems like very out of date. But the fact of the matter is virtually every organization on the planet is still run on bureaucratic principles. This will never change as a top-down initiative. I think looking forward, if you want to reinvent management, it's going to happen one experiment at a time with revolutionary goals and evolutionary steps. And the way to get it happen is to make this problem a social problem. As Stig said at the beginning, I believe deeply that going forward, every change program will be socially created. I'm going to talk to you about you how to reinvent you so that you can create and thrive in organizations that are more agile, more human, more the kind of places that we want to be in. Now, most of the time, this transition has to do with moving from leading, persuading, motivating on the basis of what we know our technical skills, our specialty expertise, our functional expertise, the stuff, the content. And usually the shift has to do with moving into leading, persuading, motivating on the basis of a broader package of skills and competencies that have to do with our ability to think strategically, to see the big picture, and then to use soft skills to get people on board, to motivate them, to inspire them, the essence of leadership, right? When you start trying out new and different things, they change your mindset about what's valuable, about what's important. And ultimately, I think the message we've been getting since this program started, it's our mindsets that need to change. But the only way our mindsets change, and here's my model, and hence the title of the book that this talk is based on, is the only way our mindsets change is because our new experiences have told us otherwise, because our mindsets are the product of our past experience. That's why what got you here won't get you there becomes a problem, because we do what we know works. And so the classic way of learning, the classic way of learning, which is to figure it out, plan, then implement, think, then do, the bureaucratic way, doesn't work for our own reinvention either, because we can only act our way into new ways of thinking. And because we don't know how to do it yet, it is necessarily experimental trial and error and pushing us towards things that are absolutely outside our comfort zone. And so the way I think about it is we've Focus loads in leadership development on introspection and reflection, which is fantastic when we have new experiences to think and reflect on. But when we're faced with this transition into the unknown, outside our comfort zone, the only thing we can do is seek what I call outside, which is the fresh perspective that you get by doing new and different things with new and different people. I am um, probably the practitioner. I've spent 25 years in IT. And uh, I've been extremely lucky to be in a company that has been a dinosaur four times and yet managed to reinvent itself. And it's in its next reinvention. So I've kind of seen firsthand what does it do to a company if you can't reinvent it? The model I call dreams and details. It's really about Inspiring people for a dream, a common dream of where we are going. Not very accurate, but very inspirational. It's a moment where people want to say, not I understand that, but I want to be part of that. If you have that moment, man, you have potential. And the next thing is not about managing and planning and KPIs, it's about the details that really matter, that you need to be significantly better at as an organization, in order to deliver on that dream, in order to increase the likelihood of getting to that dream. 
I truly believe that this is not about management. I love the management too, though. But I would rather argue that we don't need any management. We need leadership. People on stage, people that can create followership around the biggest dreams that really matter and around the details in getting them right because that's where you create the change that will bring you to the dream. I believe we are extremely lucky to be leaders in times of radical change. We may have the biggest opportunity ever to reinvent businesses, the way we live, even societies, to be much more sustainable, much more relevant, much more human. But with that luck of being leaders in times of such radical change comes an enormous obligation where you've got to stop managing and you've got to start leading. Thank you very much. So, Gary, I just want you to maybe put a few words to. So, what do you consider, it seems like you're agreeing on where we're going and how we're going to get there. What's, what, what do you consider being, is going to be the biggest barrier and how do we overcome it? You know, I've asked myself that question because it, there are days when this feels quite uh, quixotic. Um, if you think about the way we run large organizations, the command and control, all the things that Jim was so elegantly talking about, the over-reliance on planning, these are very, very deeply embedded in our organizations. In fact, I, I hope you'll forgive me for using an analogy because perhaps I'm stretching too far. But when I look at the way that large organizations squander human capability, and I also consider how deeply embedded a lot of these systems and thinking and assumptions are, the analogies I go back to are, are, are things like, like, like aristocracy and slavery and patriarchy. The starting point for all of this, and you asked me at the beginning of the day, why sometimes, you know, I, yes, I can get into a little bit of a rant, but I, I, I have to say, I think when it comes to the, the, the problems that these, this, this puts on our organizations, we've had way too much resignation and way too little indignation. And I think, you know, if you want to know how something changes and you study anything about activism, it's when people finally say, this is intolerable. And I want to say it's intolerable. The good news is there are alternatives.